There is a new chapter unfolding in the age-old struggle around voting rights in the U.S., and true to history, it is disproportionately affecting minority voters. What can the past potentially tell us about fair and equitable access to the ballot box in the future? Dr. Thomas J. Ward Jr. is a historian and assistant dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at Farmingdale State College. Dr. Ward is an award-winning author and an expert in American civil rights history. We're so glad you had some time for us today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Well, voter suppression has a 150-year history in the U.S., from the 15th Amendment to Jim Crow laws to the Voting Rights Act of 65 to special provisions. From the end of the Civil War through the American Civil Rights Movement, there were significant legislative victories. But did they have any impact at all on discriminatory practices to get us where we are today? Well, I, yeah, I think we can learn a lot from from the history. Uh, you, know, you mentioned going back to the to the 15th Amendment. Um, you know, the 15th Amendment. We often think and it's kind of taught in school is, you know, gave gave black men the right to vote or gave the former slaves the right to vote. It's actually, it was a very weak law. You know, it, it says you can't deprive anybody, uh, no state can deprive someone of the vote because of their race, color, or previous condition of servitude, which means you can deprive them of the vote for a whole host of other reasons. And and what we saw is is in the late 19th century, first you saw violence and intimidation as, as a way to keep black men from voting uh, in the South. And then in 1890, uh, you have the, the, the Mississippi Constitution. And the Mississippi Constitution uh, is, is put together uh, as, as, as one of the, uh, the, the members of the, uh, the Constitutional Committee said, our purpose here is to take the vote away from the Negro. I mean, they, they, weren't, they weren't being secretive of it, but they had to do it in a way that wouldn't violate the, the, the letter of the law, the letter of the, the 15th Amendment. So uh, they came up uh, with, with a, a couple of uh, policies, but the most important were the poll tax, and the literacy test. Uh, you know, the poll tax said you had to pay uh, a tax um, uh, to in order to vote, and and you got a receipt, and you, you when you showed up uh, to vote, you had, you had to pro provide that receipt. Uh, the literacy test said you had to either be able to read uh, uh, to the registrars, you know, read a section of, of whatever the registrar provided you, or be able to understand it. And the what was called the understanding clause. The understanding clause was the real kicker. Um, because what it had, uh, allowed uh, the registrar to do is, if you were a literate black person, you could uh, you, you, he could say, okay, you, you've read that for me. Now, what does it mean? And 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 so so you know, I'll give you a, a, a section of the Constitution to read. You can read it letter perfect, but now you have to interpret it to the registrar's um, the registrar's uh, happiness. And you know, the registrar can always say that's not that's not any good. So the understanding clause also allowed um, uh, Mississippi to to enfranchise uh, whites that were illiterate, uh, because uh, uh, what it said is, okay, you come in, you say I can't read. The registrar can then read something to you, and then you can tell you know if you understand it. So uh, a black person who's, who's literate can come in, read the section of the Constitution, be told to interpret it, and the, and the registrar says no. A white person who says, oh, I can't read, the registrar says. Uh, the fox jumped over the log. Can you tell me what that meant? He said, well, it meant the fox jumped over the log. Well, you can vote. So it was, it was used to disfranchise literate and enfranchise illiterate people. The uh, African-Americans knew what, what this was done and, and take it, took it to the Supreme Court, a case, uh, 1898 case called Williams versus Mississippi, said this is clearly discriminatory. It go, goes against the spirit, if not the letter of the 15th Amendment. And the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that no, it doesn't. The, the U.S. Supreme Court said the Mississippi Constitution was legal. Um, and of course, once the Supreme Court gave it its blessing, and this is two years after the Plessy decision, um, just like with the Plessy decision that then legalized segregation everywhere, um, the, the, uh, with the Williams versus Mississippi case legalized things like the literacy test and the understanding clause and poll taxes. And of course, then they explode in the early 20th century. And you see by World War I, really, uh, the, the black vote is, has been reduced to almost uh, nothing. I mean, there were always some black voters, but they, they ceased to be a, a, a power. Jump ahead to 1965, the, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and of course, people are uh, you know, well aware of uh, you know, the, the Selma March and John Lewis. Uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is very, very effective. It is a strong law. Um, it does, um, you know, threaten states with federal intervention if if they don't uh, if they if they don't register votes, and most importantly, it had 
uh, what was called the pre-clearance um, condition that said states that fell underneath states and localities that fell under um, uh, discriminatory practices, a history of discrimination, which was identified the trigger uh, mechanism was if they if, if uh, fewer than 50% of eligible voters were, were registered to vote, then the federal government said, if you're going to change any of your voting laws, if you're going to change your district, if you're going to change uh, the way you elect people, go to a, 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 a city council from a mayor system, um, go to at-large voting. It had to then be approved by the district court in, in uh, Washington, D.C. And so that was very effective. And, and of course, we see starting in the late 60s, um, we, we see black voters emerge in places like, you know, Mississippi and Alabama that, you know, were majority, you know, Mississippi was a majority black state. Alabama, South Carolina were about 50% at, at, at this time. They now have elected officials. You know, it, it, you know, Mississippi goes from having no black elected officials in, in you know, the early 1960s, they have the, the largest number by the early 1970s. So, it, it, you know, the, the 1965 Act was very effective. When you look at all the laws, the amendments enacted over a century and a half, it should ensure easy access to the ballot box for all voters, but voter suppression persists. Why is that? Is it really about curbing fraud or has it always been about suppressing minority voters? It's, a, it's about suppressing uh, any voter that you, you, you think is not going to help your, help your cause. Um, now, be that done through gerrymandering um, and, and you know, redistricting to help. Uh, certainly uh, do it, it can be done, not just to minority voters, but to, uh, you know, to uh, poor areas, uh, you know, you districting, uh, because you know that, that people, because of their wealth, are going to vote a certain way. Uh, what we're seeing a great deal now, which is not always talked about, is trying to suppress the, um, the votes of students. Um, you know, Texas uh, famously, you know, one of their new voting rights laws, you know, which required an ID, you can use your concealed carry permit as a, as a legitimate uh, voter ID, but you can't use your student ID as, as, a, as a legitimate voter ID. Um, and, and so it, it certainly there, there's an attempt to um, uh, go after uh, minority voters, but it's not just minority voters and it's never just been it. It's, it's going after any group that you think you can identify how they are going to vote and therefore drawing lines or making it more difficult for them, for them to, to vote. Obviously, because African Americans, at least since the late 1960s, have voted heavily Democratic, uh, that that becomes an easy target. And because they live in, and we still have residential segregation in this country, uh, it, it then becomes easy to identify uh, ways to uh, limit limit their limit their vote. Well, right now there are more than 360 bills with restrictive provisions in some 45 states. Are today's tactics modernized versions from the old Jim Crow playbook designed to discourage and demoralize? I mean, no water in line seems like an obscure law. Yes, and, and, and they are out of uh, the old playbook, but they're also dealing with um, the, you know, the water in line is, is an interesting one uh, because uh, you know, we, we, we look at a lot of these um, uh, new laws like the voter ID laws as things that have come since, uh, since the Shelby versus Holder case in, in 2013, because the pre-clearance that we talked about earlier, pre-clearance is gutted in, in 2013. But things like the water in line, those, th that deals with issues that, that predated um, uh, Shelby. Um, because what we've, what we've seen since the 1960s, as we started to see a significant black, black vote, is that there were ways uh, that you didn't have to go through pre-clearance to try to frustrate the black vote. And, and one of the ways, one of the main ways, which, which like I said, predated 2013 is things we still see today. And, you know, every election you see pictures of long lines, um, you know, in, uh, in African-American districts. Those things have, were, you know, were done in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, things like um, make sure that there are fewer polling places in majority black districts, make sure there are fewer voting machines within those polling places. There tends to be, you know, you can be a, cons a conspiracy theorist or not, that the machines break down more often in, in, those, in those districts. And so that, that creates a situation where, you know, historically over the last 50 years, there are longer lines in minority districts. And so groups brought water and food to people in line because they didn't want them to get discouraged, right? 
you know, if you live in a white district, you tend to be able to walk in 15, 15 minutes later, you walk out, you, you, you voted. If you live in a black, black district, maybe only five miles away, you may have to wait two, three, four, five hours to vote. And so if you're waiting that long, people were bringing water, bringing, bringing snacks. So this is, you know, that is, you know, kind of this absurd law to many of us, but it is rooted in something that is, is really a, a practice that's, that's 40, 50 years old, which is making it harder for minority communities to, to vote through other tactics. Uh, you know, like I say, fewer, fewer polling places, fewer machines, things like that, longer lines. Well, John Lewis was a major player in the civil rights movement and the bloody protest in Selma that resulted in the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The appropriately named John Lewis Voting Rights uh, Advancement Act is set to restore key sections of the Voting Rights Act. So it's like we're right back full circle. How are key sections able to be gutted? It's like a cycle that keeps repeating. Yeah, the... the uh... The case, uh, Supreme Court case Shelby versus Holder in 2013, gutted the preclearance part of the, the Voting Rights Act. And uh, it, it was it, kind of a bizarre, dis the, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote the decision for the majority. Um, and his argument was, he, he made, basically made two arguments. The first one was uh, preclearance was no longer needed because it worked so well, which is kind of a, a bizarre argument. He, he said, look, 50 years later, we don't need it because we don't have the type of discrimination that we had in the 19, 1960s. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg in her, in her dissent said, that's like saying we'll get rid of our umbrella because we're not wet walking through the rain anymore. <laughs> you know, she, and and, you know, and she, she was dead on. She said, as soon as you get rid of that uh, uh, umbrella, you're gonna get wet. And, and she said, as soon as we get rid of these preclearance pre conditions, uh, requirements, you're gonna see a lot of the same conditions go back. And so she was dead on there. The other argument that Roberts made was that it was unfair uh, because it only signaled, signaled out certain states. And he said, you know, because this didn't treat every state fairly, um, it, was, it was unconstitutional. Um, but, you know, as Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, had warned, as soon as literally within weeks of, of this uh, decision uh, that, that, that stripped preclearance away from these areas, states like Texas and Alabama and South Carolina and Virginia that had had uh, that had fallen under the preclearance conditions, they began to pass things like voter ID laws. Um, and, and so that's where we're, we're seeing all these new laws come from just in the, in the, past, in the past seven years. So the Lewis Act, um, first and foremost, is, is, is trying to restore this preclearance um, uh, condition the, to give the federal government um, some oversight over uh, when states um, uh, pass new voting voting laws. Well, and there's suggestions that it has more likely, it's more likely to have success in passage in the Senate than the much broader For the People Act. But despite the history of voter suppression in the U.S., can you see reasons to be optimistic about the future of voting? The Electoral College has overruled the will of the people in two of the last five presidential elections. Is a loud citizen movement enough? Are there enough Stacey Abrams out there? Or is an overhaul to a more balanced nationwide election system the only answer? I, I, I'm not tremendously optimistic, unfortunately. I think, you know, you see... Uh, what, what we have really today, uh, because of the Electoral College, because of the, um, the way the Senate and, and, uh, is, is structured, which is the way it was you know, structured by the founders, but the founders couldn't really have conceived of the difference between Wyoming and California having the same number of, of senators. Um, and, 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 and so it, it, the, the Senate, which of course is tied, the numbers are tied directly to the, the Electoral College is so out of balance um, that, that creates a, a problem. Obviously, the Electoral College, even though Joe Biden won by over 7 million votes in the popular vote um, and won this election, it was, it was very close in the Electoral College. And, and if, you know, a, a couple uh, thousand votes in a couple states, you know, we would have had uh, 2016, uh, you know, all, all over again, where someone with a significant popular vote would have, would have lost the, the electoral, uh, electoral College. So I think that's, that's a problem. The problem of gerrymandering is, is, is extremely difficult. Um, and, and once again, you look at um, the way it's done both on the state level and on the national level uh, where you have uh, a, a tremendous Im imbalance um, uh, because of, of the way in the, in the Congress and also in state legislatures um, between uh, 
what what a majority of people a, a party a majority of people vote for and actually who sits in their in their in their congress which is something the for the people uh, act wants to get rid of um is, is find a way around gerrymandering so i think without the for the people act i think there's a lot of difficulties going ahead the one area i am optimistic on um and you mentioned Sp stacy abrams is that i think there is tremendous awareness amongst many people um and especially amongst minority communities that their vote is valuable because if it wasn't valuable people wouldn't be trying so hard to restrict it and when you look at the 2020 election you look at the tremendous turnout um that shows that people even even you know standing in those lines that they're willing to do it and the the, the special election in georgia um the, the the tremendous turnout so that's the hope i have <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, I really hope that the, the For the People Act is passed. I, I'm, I'm becoming discouraged that it's not going to be passed. And I think we've got stormy seas ahead without it. Um, but I think the fact that we saw so many people uh, vote in 2020 and, 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 you know, willing to stand in, in long lines and that they're aware of, of the importance of their vote is, is something we've not really seen in, in a generation. So that is the, the one, I think, silver lining. Well, your vote is your voice, and so it has every right to be heard. Dr. Ward, thanks so much for taking us back and into the future as well to show us how history may play a role in the future at the ballot box in the United States. Thanks so much for your time. Great. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it.